Friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in September 2016, a number of families of the victims of the 1988 massacre approached us to look into the way to uh, follow up on this crime that took place nearly 30 years ago. Uh, the members of the families and actually former prisoners, survivors of that massacre, uh, urged us to get together and form an association for the for the justice for the members or the victims of the 1988 massacre in Iran. And indeed, we launched this association in Geneva in September 2016. And one of the major tasks we put for this association was to compile the existing evidence that a crime against humanity did take place against political prisoners in Iran in the period of July 88 till December 88. Uh, in fact, a number of uh, British lawyers including here with us Christy Bremlow and uh, also the late Nigel Rodley, uh, Jeffrey Robertson, uh, and a long list of uh, very highly qualified lawyers uh, had given us guidance in producing this report, which has been submitted to the High Commissioner of Human Rights in Geneva and also to the United Nations Secretary General in New York. So this work has been done in appliance to the United Nations methodology in fact-finding for the fact-finding missions. Basically, the work has adopted the irrefutable evidence. Uh, we follow strictly the standards of objectivity and impartiality. And we looked into what has already been published as evidence, but the main source in 1988 of information about this crime was the media, the Iranian media itself, governmental media, because between 88 and 89, the regime still allowed the governmental media to publish figures. After 88, the regime has given instructions to black out the whole operations, and since then uh, we had no more governmental uh, evidence available to us. But the main and important source of information that was made available was actually the special representative of the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations appointed to cover the period of the situation of human rights in Iran between 86 and 95. Uh, the special representative of the commission was the uh, Salvadorian uh, professor Rinaldo Ganildo Paul. He reported from 86 to 95 and covered the period of the massacre between July uh, 
1988 and December 1988. That is the period that the uh, Professor Ganildo covered. And uh, I might just for you, uh, I know uh, I've been informed that a PDF copy of this report has been circulated, so I will not go into details. But I would like to, uh, for your uh, attention now, to quote from the report of Professor Ganildo uh, Paul uh, of the period. It's a report that covers the period July 88, December 88. Paragraph 72 of the, this report states, the special representative reached the moral conviction that the persons appearing before him, because he heard many uh, survivors and members of the families of the victims, the persons appearing before him refer to facts that certainly happened to them, and that declarations were not a product of feverish imagination or of mere fabrication guided by political or religious motivation. This is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the issue who actually covered that period. He says, these persons presented the traces of maltreatment and exposed their account of, ev of events in a convincing, articulate, and coherent manner. He continues saying, it appears that the persistence of alleged violation of human rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran, in particular the recent reports of a renewed wave of ex executions in the period from July to September 88, suffices to justify international concern and the need for the, con uh, for, for the competent United Nations organs to continue monitoring the situation in that country. I think this statement is enough to show that the United Nations were actually well informed, they were aware of an ongoing massacre taking place. It's been reported, but unfortunately at the time the Iranian government managed to divert the attention of the United Nations and the world community by trying to uh, impose a discussion or an argument about which laws are applicable and which laws are more supreme than others. So it became purely academic discussion about international law and Sharia law and which one prevails. So this is how the United Nations was uh, taken out of context and uh, by 95, the report of the Special Rapporteur has ceased talking about the massacre. Uh, another uh, piece of evidence I would like you to uh, uh, be aware of is that uh, a report uh, prepared by uh, Sir Jeffrey Robertson QC. <coughs> you know very well that uh, 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 Jeffrey Robertson has been trusted by the United Nations to preside the Sierra Leone uh, uh, UN Court on Human Rights. And he served as a judge and president of the court. A uh, man a professional of this caliber, his statements on the 1988 massacre should be taken seriously, no doubt. Uh, the man has been trusted by the United Nations about presiding the court on Sierra Leone. I don't see why should not trust him on investigating this massacre and his uh, uh, conclusion were quite shocking. Uh, judge, uh, I, I refer to him as a judge, not just as a uh, QC, because he's a judge for the United Nations, uh, stated that these massacres, 
1998 massacres. These massacres undoubtedly occurred pretty much as alleged in 1988 in prisons where political prisoners were detained. They took place, broadly speaking, in two waves. First, the death committee came to, for the uh, unrepentant Mujahideen, and then after that, uh, after a short break, the, for the atheists and agnostics, communists, and for the leftists, it asserted as uh, apostates. There was a good deal of confusion in complying with the fatwa, especially the uh, Khomeini's fatwa, especially in provincial prisons, which may be explained by the fact that the massacre, whether or not planned in advance, were triggered in a furious malice against the Mujahideen. This is, this is broadly the conclusion of Jeffrey Robertson. Uh, in the same period, uh, there, was, there are reports from Amnesty International. And, and uh, we are all aware about the methodology of the work of Amnesty International. And I, I think uh, Amnesty's reports uh, are highly credible. It's not just Amnesty International. It's also the International Federation for Human Rights, which produced a lengthy uh, report uh, also confirming that a serious massacre of extrajudicial killing has taken place in prisons against prisoners who are serving uh, a, a period of imprisonment based on a, another judgment. Whether this judgment is fair or not, this is another matter, but those were executed while they serving a sentence lesser than a life sentence. Now, the, 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 uh, this core of evidence is, is there. We have compiled the information about uh, how the Iranian government has uh, misled the United Nations and has imposed a way of working in order to uh, divert the attention. And indeed, uh, they have been successful uh, to a certain extent in diverting the attention since up till today, no formal United Nations uh, investigation has taken place. Uh, the reality is that this report now has provided the uh, reasons for the crime to have taken place and Khomeini's fatwa and the challenges that that fatwa has faced among grand ayatollahs. So the regime itself including number two of the regime at the time, uh, Hussein Ali Montezuri, who said, history will uh, take us one of the days because he was strongly opposed to execute people who have a, uh, a, a, a different opinion or different uh, way of thinking about how to uh, rule that country. So the evidence uh, uh, pointing at how the government has taken these decisions based on uh, Khomeini's fatwa is there. It's well documented and uh, uh, it's clear. The, the second thing is uh, the people, the suspect perpetrators, Suspect perpetrators of a crime against humanity are also identifiable. And this report has managed to identify a large number of them, but I wouldn't say all of them. Uh, the, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, in the near future, 
a commission of inquiry could uh, update this list of suspect perpetrators. Uh, the other issue is that uh, the uh, uh, crimes that took place uh, were witnessed by some survivors of the prisons. Uh, JVM, our justice for the 1988 uh, massacre against the Iranian prisoners, has conducted a number of interviews with those who survived that massacre, those who were in prison at that time. I was personally involved in those interviews, and they are recorded and they are documented uh, in this report. The other very important uh, evidence, which also verifiable evidence, are the locations, the list, the locations of the mass graves, their ad precise addresses. So la uh, recently I was in Geneva and I spoke to the diplomatic community and I told them that you have verifiable addresses in Tehran and elsewhere and it's up to the diplomatic community to challenge this report by going to verify on the spot those mass graves. So we have the list of the suspect perpetrators. We have the list of the mass graves. And we have the list of the uh, victims. And let me say about the victims, because no serious official investigation has been conducted so far. So there is a lot of speculation about the number of victims. Are uh, those who try to minimize, and they refer to a figure like 7,000 victims. But there are also those who speak about 20,000 victims. The figure of 30,000 also is given, and uh, there are those who refer to 120,000 victims. So uh, as far as the report is concerned, the exact figure is irrelevant. What is relevant is that there is a crime against humanity that has taken place between uh, July 2008, uh, 1988 and December 1988. That is a crime against humanity by all standards. And uh, uh, Jeffrey Robertson has written actually a detailed report about how to categorize what happened as a crime against humanity and possibly a crime of genocide. Now, all these crimes that have taken place are still ongoing. It's not finished. It's still ongoing to the extent that the United Nations is still on a yearly basis renewing the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Iran. Uh, I will not uh, go further into this, but I would like to, you to understand why did we take this initiative. Since the United Nations has uh, been very shy uh, in dealing with this issue, they haven't really taken the enough courage to face Iran and say enough is enough. The perpetrators had to be uh, held accountable. Now, by presenting this report to the United Nations, the High Commission of Human Rights, the United Nations Secretary General, and all the, the diplomatic community uh, represented in Geneva, they have received the report. So it's a challenge today to the UN, it's a challenge to the diplomatic community. We request an independent in, uh, commission of inquiry. This is overdue. Luckily, we are dealing with a crime, luckily or unluckily, I don't know. We are dealing with a crime that is unprescriptable. Whether it's 30 years, whether it's 100 years, a crime against humanity remains a crime against humanity. And we want the United Nations 
to act on this. It will be very embarrassing for the United Nations to see this report and to keep quiet about it. I thank you very much for your said that there is a copy available as a PDF uh, if people would like to read the whole um, full report. Um, our next speaker is uh, the Right Honourable Theresa Villiers, Conservative MP for Chipping Barnet. Theresa.